Fiji has promised to significantly cut emissions in an effort to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees and restore the health of its oceans. Well, here with me to discuss this is Sixth Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Baroness Scotland, and Prime Minister of Fiji, Frank Bynaramara. Uh, welcome to both of you. Uh, very good to meet you, Prime Minister. Can you tell us, first of all, what's your main priority as you come to COP? What answers are you seeking here in Glasgow? Well, we've uh, come to uh, get some positive outcome from, from Glasgow. Uh, in the last couple of uh, days, uh, they, we, have, we have come across some positive outcomes. Uh, we've seen good progress to leverage uh, private sector finance. Uh, we reversed uh, deforestation, uh, you cut uh, methane emissions. Those are positive outcomes. Those are some of the things that we come to Glasgow for. Uh, but there are still massive gaps, if I can say, there are still massive gaps in climate ambition uh, we are yet to fill. Uh, but uh, until we do, leaders of the low-lying uh, islands, nations can't look uh, at our people in the eye and promise them a secure future. I've said before that we are all in one global canoe, the Ndrua, that we uh, brought forth in uh, COP23. But our canoe is still taking on water. Uh, and if we look ahead, there are still storms on the horizon. These uh, negotiations that are taking place around us must secure commitments, must bring about commitments that set us toward calm sea of uh, carbon uh, neutrality. So how is Fiji affected right now by climate change? And what are your concerns about the future if well, it's not I'm, properly addressed? Thank you. I'm uh, particularly worried uh, that some major players are not here with us, uh, not here in Glasgow at all. My message to them is this, uh, that you must uh, make, up your, make up for your no-show with uh, serious climate action. When your grandchildren ask, uh, ask where you were at this defining moment in history, you may not be able to say that you were here, but at least you can tell them what you did. So uh, those are some of the concerns. I also see that we're quite close to reaching the U.S. $100 billion pledge, that, uh, the pledge that somebody that was created some years ago. Uh, I urge wealthy nations to finish the job uh, what, what is 100 billion next to trillions we spend on the pandemic and the, and the trillions we regularly spurge on the weapons of war, as we've heard regularly in the, the last uh, decade. This uh, climate crisis is the conflict of our time. We've been saying that all the time. And if we don't pay now to uh, help vulnerable nations mitigate climate uh, change and adapt its uh, impacts, will all pay a much higher price down the track. That's what I keep saying. You talk about notable absences. Was your message for China's premier? Is that who you were yes, directing yes, your message to? Yes. Just to, to clarify. To all who are not here, to all high emitters who are not here with us. OK. Thank you for that. I'm just going to bring in Baroness Scotland here. You're Commonwealth Secretary General. You represent the interests of 54 member countries. Uh, what are your concerns? What concerns are you representing, if you like, for, amongst those countries? Well, as you know, we have uh, 32 of our members are small, vulnerable member states. 25 are island states, one of them, of course, being Fiji. And what we have seen is a dupe, uh, what, doubling of the crises, the climatic crises in the last 10 years. We've had six of the biggest hurricanes the world has ever seen in the last four years. They, these used to happen once in a lifetime. So for our small member states, 1.5 to stay alive isn't just a slogan, it is the reality. Many of our member states have seen themselves almost destroyed. If you think about the country of my birth, Dominica, we were struck first in, by, by Erica in 2015. 95% of the GDP was destroyed. Then two years later, Maria, the biggest hurricane the world had seen uh, in 2017, 226% of the GDP gone. That is 
the reality of climate change. So when we come here, when the small states come here, we come here on their behalf, but with the big ones too, because this climate crisis has left no one behind. We're all touched by it. So we're saying the commitment that we made as a global community in 2009 for that 100 billion, we have to deliver on it. And it's shaming that we haven't done it yet, but we need for that 100 billion to have 50% of it as adaptation. Now, people are saying that it's coming, but we've heard it before. So we need to make sure that 100 billion is real money, new money, not old dressed up money. And we've got to make sure it's given into the hands of those who desperately need it, but who have the political commitment, like Fiji, who say, we want this. We didn't create this mess, but we need to clean it up. And I do think that human genius has got us into this mess, and human genius is going to have to get us out. I think we can do it if we work together, and the Commonwealth, as one third of the world, is saying we are willing to work together, we are willing to up our ambitions. And if you look at the uh, NDC commitments that have been made by our Commonwealth countries, they are truly ambitious. But it's not just having the ambition, we have to deliver, and we have to deliver now because we are at code red. And if we don't do it, I can't imagine what's going to happen to us all. And we've heard from a number of figures here about this $100 billion, saying that the money isn't together yet. They are hopeful that it will be there by 2023. What do you make of that? And is it enough if it stays at $100 billion? Well, you know, we needed this 100 billion yesterday. Absolutely, I understand that people have challenges. But, you know, when we had to make a commitment because of COVID, we found trillions. This is the biggest crisis the world has ever seen. It is existential. So I think we have to up that ambition and we have to make sure that their 100 billion is delivered and it should be delivered now. So Prime Minister Bainarawa, where would the money go in Fiji? You are, are calling for this money to help nations like your own. What's your priority right now? You're talking about the 100 billion? Well, yes, okay. the money that would come towards well, Fiji, yeah. Uh, blue finance is the next big dive for us. Uh, our ocean deserves an increasing share of climate finance. And we've been talking about that in the last uh, three, four COPs. But just as importantly, uh, the overall pool of finance needs to increase given the need to mitigate. Uh, but particularly the need to adapt uh, is going to rise over this dec decade. We can put blue finance to work to bring our boats and shipping fleets into renewable electric power engines. We can do that. With this, with this funding. We can use it to grow our aquaculture sector. Uh, we will need to, as specific uh, staples like tuna, uh, are leaving our warming waters uh, for cooler seas away from the equator, and we can use it to pioneer ocean-based energy, such as wave and, and, and tidal power that we've seen uh, advertised in the last couple of days. That's right. And uh, we're talking a lot about energy today, so that's very relevant. Uh, but Baroness Scotland, for many of these nations, they are island states, aren't they? So the ocean is hugely Absolutely. important. And there are so many issues that, that there, Absolutely. aren't there? Um, they're worried about rising sea levels, obviously will affect communities, but also acidification, Absolutely. worrying about bleaching of coral reefs. How would you describe the, the, the challenges facing our oceans? Well, there are huge challenges, and that's why we in the Commonwealth came together in 2018, and we committed, all 54 countries are committed to delivering on our blue charter. So it's not just signing up to commitments. We ask the question, how do we do it? How do we take the plastics out of our seas? How do we regrow our coral? 
How do we make sure that mangroves are there to be the buffer that we need? Now, that blue charter has had a huge commitment from all our member states who are putting their money where their mouth is. We're sharing expertise, we're sharing knowledge, we're sharing the empirical data. So through that blue charter, we are already making a quantifiable difference, but we need to do more. And this is where the money comes in, because we have the ambition, we have the know-how, but now we need the financing. We are, we've created something called common sensing to take the spatial data and inform the policies and then what we do. But we've also just, in the last couple of days, been talking we have three Rio conventions on climate change, which we've committed to, but how do we turn those commitment into actual action? And when we go to Chogham in next year, we hope Chogham, which is the heads of government meeting, we hope that all our leaders will do just as they did in 2018, commit to the call for living lands and turn commitment into concrete action. And there's a lot more for us to do. But I do think we can do it, but only if we work together. The Commonwealth, as you know, has been banging this drum since 1989 when we met together in Langkawi, three years before the first COP. And it's a tragedy, because if you go back and read that Langkawi declaration, everything that's happened in the last 30 years was predicated, was in 1989. So the Commonwealth, we don't want to be right. We don't want to find that our islands will disappear when we get to 1.5. We want everybody to hear that call, know that if we choose, we can reverse this, commit to reversing it, and then actually do it. And I am so thrilled that in the Commonwealth member states, particularly the 32 most vulnerable, the commitment is absolutely passionate. But goodness, we need the help. And we need the help from everybody. I, know, heard, I noticed you've got something. Yes, that... you've heard the Secretary General talk about the Blue Charter. Mm. It's working well for the Commonwealth. But I have here with me a Climate Change Act. Yep. That's uh, this is your from Fiji. Governments. Fiji yeah. is a climate change act and a national oceans policy. Uh, first in the region and first for small island states. So that was endorsed by parliament in the next couple of days. I don't have time to read it this second. So no, tell please. me, what are the main elements <laughs> of your climate change act? What are you doing it, it, in Fiji it, it to legally, try to go green? It legally empowers us to achieve net zero climate commitment into law. We, we turn that into law. It's a real plan. Uh, and every nation should have one. That's what I'm saying. And uh, I have a copy for you if you like. Uh, yeah, thank you. But, but also, I think one of the things that's been great is that the Commonwealth Secretariat was able to create a climate change legal toolkit so that all our member states who want to implement the Paris Agenda, because it's about implementation. We can sign up to it, but what does it mean in law? What does it mean in terms of legislation, the regulation? How are we going to make our different institutions deliver on this? So the Climate Act that has been produced by Fiji is a real exemplar of what other countries may wish to do, and our toolkit I hope will help everyone who wishes to put the Paris agenda into action and into law will be able to do it. And and how have you what's your feeling here at COP? Have you felt listened to while you're here? Do you feel that people want to act and will act? What's your what's your instinct? Yes, as I said, we've uh, we've come for some positive outcomes and those positive outcomes have been realized. But uh, as we keep saying all along, everyone has been saying that, that 1.5 is the only threshold worth fighting for. 1.5. I can see your badge. Yeah. Uh, it is the single most important number of this century, and people should take note of that. Baroness Scotland, what's your feeling? Do you feel optimistic? I feel more optimistic than I was because this is not just something which is committed to now by our countries. The reason that I feel more optimistic is that business and others are seeing that this is the future for them too. So the commitment that has been made by business to deliver on that Paris agenda is phenomenal. And also it's great to have the United States 
back in the tent. And, you know, everyone's saying welcome home to them. Baroness Scotland, Frank Bannerarama, Fijian Prime Minister, thank you both very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.